I want to thank you for coming. This is going to prove, I think, to be an exciting event. We're very proud to have Brad Evans with us this evening, or this, or this morning. Uh, is it evening? I'm not sure. Uh, so let, why, don't we, why don't we begin? It's an honor and a privilege to welcome Brad Evans here today as the third speaker in the uh, Distinguished Scholar Speaker Series in Critical Pedagogy, a series that is hosted in partnership between the McMaster Institute for Innovation and Excellence in Teaching and Learning and McMaster Center for Scholarship in the Public Interest. As always, a number of people have played a crucial role in enabling the series to take place. First, I want to thank Ashad Ahmed, who is not here today, who heads Meadow, for sponsoring this event. But I also want to particularly thank Jennifer, Jen, Jennifer Fisher, Jennifer Foubert, Amy McIntosh, and Balana Nagovin. This lecture series forms but one part of a larger project whose motivation is to understand and address the role that higher education might play in a democracy and why it's under attack by a range of neoliberal and authoritarian forces in North America and in many other parts of the world. In an age in which the culture of higher education has become synonymous with the culture of business, it might be an understatement to insist that higher education is suffering from both a crisis of legitimacy and a crisis of politics. Universities appear increasingly removed from the discourse of public values and the ideals of a substantive democracy at a time when it's most imperative to defend educational institutions against an onslaught of forces that are as anti-intellectual as they are anti-democratic in nature. As market mentalities and moralities tighten their grip on all aspects of society, democratic institutions and public spheres such as higher education are being privatized, commodified, underfunded, and in some cases disappearing. And as these institutions vanish from higher education to public libraries, there's a serious erosion of the discourses of community, justice, equality, public values, and the common good. We increasingly live in societies based on the vocabulary of choice, absent any, any mention of constraints. And a denial of reality, a denial of massive inequality, social disparities, the irresponsible co concentration of power in relatively few hands, and a growing machinery of social death, spectacle of violence, and a culture of cruelty. As power becomes global and is removed from local and nation-based politics, more and more individuals and groups are being defined by a kind of free-floating class of ultra-rich and corporate power brokers as disposable, redundant, and irrelevant. The logic of disposability haunts higher education. And one of the challenges it faces is how, is how it might address the fact that there are a growing number of people, especially young people, who increasingly inhabit what we might call zones of hardship, suffering, exclusion, joblessness, and terminal, terminal exclusion. More and more youth live in a world marked by a deepening uncertainty about the future, a present that views them as excess, and neoliberal politics that writes them out of the scripts of power, democracy, and hope itself. This grim reality has produced a failure in the power of the civic imagination, political will, and open democracy. It also is part of a politics that strips society of any democratic ideals. Given this current crisis, educators, intellectuals, youth, administrators, and other cultural workers, I would argue, need a new political and pedagogical language for addressing the changing context and issues facing a world in which capital draws upon unprecedented convergences of resources, financial, cultural, political, economic, scientific, military, and technological, to exercise powerful and diverse forms of control. If educators and others are to counter Global capitalism's increased ability to separate the traditional sphere of politics from the now transnational reach of power. It's crucial to develop educational approaches that reject the collapse of the distinction between market liberties and civil liberties, a market economy and a market society. This suggests developing public spheres capable of constructing forms of moral and political agency willing to challenge neoliberalism and other anti-democratic conditions, including the criminalization of social problems such as homelessness. <laughs>
Under such circumstances, higher education becomes more than a business, an obsession with measurable utility, a site for performing, for promoting conformity. That is, it becomes more than a disimagination machine, a site that treats faculty as a form of cheap labor, students as consumers, and education as a form of training. At stake here is recognizing the power of education in creating the formative cultures, identities, dispositions, and civic capacities necessary for students and faculty to both challenge the various threats being mobilized against the very idea of the university as a site of critical learning and to create pedagogical practices that unsettle common sense assumptions and push at the far reaches of the imagination while inspiring and energizing students to struggle for a more just and democratic world. Contrary to a view of education stripped of its civic purposes, we are incredibly fortunate to have my friend and colleague Brad Evans here today, whose research and public advocacy has necessarily insisted on examining the violent configurations impacting on our social and economic worlds and the democratic potential of educational institutions and diverse cultural apparatuses in the face of such profound historical challenges. Brad is a political philosopher, critical theorist, and writer whose work specializes on, on the, in the problem of violence, on the problem of violence. He may be one of the few living critical theorists working today in the legacies of Gramsci, Raymond Williams, and C. Wright Mills, who understands and makes central to his work the educative nature of politics, and who, like the late Pierre Bourdieu, recognizes that the most important forms of domination are not only economic, but also intellectual and pedagogical and lie on the side of belief and persuasion. For Brad, there is no politics without identification, one that recognizes that people have to invest something of themselves in order to individually and collectively keep justice from going dead in themselves in the larger world. Across all of his projects, his research has asked us to consider what is seen and not seen, what is represented and ignored, and ultimately whose lives matter and whose do not in a given social order that is mediated through a neoliberal politics of spectacle, violence, and disposability. As a political ideology that champions a market-based approach to all aspects of social life, Neoliberalism has become the primary mediating force used to articulate the bulk of our social arrangements and institutions. Perhaps, most acute, the, perhaps the most acute and important element of its power centers in how it functions as a form of public pedagogy, taking on a wider accumulation of meaning and educative effort through a host of social institutions, mediums, and languages. It has produced, as a result, a range of market-driven values that shape not only higher education, but also produces and legitimates a consumer culture that celebrates self-interest, the ethos of greed, wages an attack on the notion of the common good, privatizes public goods, and gives credence to a throwaway society that dispenses with resources and goods, all the while supporting a notion that everything must be measured by the odd stick of profit. Brad's research has critically documented the connective forms of neoliberal regimes and ideologies across its various registers, from evidence of mass surveillance, the militarization of the police, and the rise of the punishing state, to the impact of violence in Hollywood films and video games, along with, an along with the increasing disparities in wealth and power. But just as equally, his research and the digital-based projects he has worked tirelessly to produce, including the Histories of Violence project, which if you haven't seen, please Google it and, and take a look. It's really important. Have insisted on the need and necessities of critical pedagogies that can work to counter the dominant logic of neoliberal violence and cruelty. Brad's research and advocacy as a public intellectual has been at the forefront of efforts looking to reclaim education as a public good buttressed by a, a notion of educated hope. His work not only holds power accountable, it also refuses to surrender the treatment of others to the logic of disposability, while addressing and interpreting spectacles of violence in a wide variety of forms, and in the process, makes visible those spheres of collective work, work that render violence tolerable, or render violence intolerable. He's the author of 10 books and edited volumes, along with over 40 academic and media articles. 
He currently serves as the senior lecturer of the School of Sociology, Politics, and International Studies at the University of Bristol. He's a founder and director of the Acclaim History of Violence Project. And in this capacity, he is currently leading a global research in initiative on the theme of disposable life to interrogate the meaning of mass violence in the 21st century, an initiative that I have had the great fortune and pleasure to work with Brad on, writing a new book published this year titled Disposable Futures, The Seduction of Violence in the Age of the Spectacle. Please join me warmly in welcoming my friend and colleague, Brad Evans. Thanks for a very kind and generous introduction, Henry. Um, the, um, the title of the talk today, um, Intolerable Violence, I guess, you know, um, leaves nothing unmasked and invariably um, speaks to what Henry, uh, I guess, aptly uh, conjures up as to him, the grim reality of our con contemporary moment. I guess I should make a very clear indication from the outset, of course, the, um, the title of this talk um, kind of points to the, um, this much of the narrative which I'm going to go through, which is quite a difficult and unsettling narrative at times. But in that sense, I think this, then, that none of the images I will show are nothing you've never seen before. Um, but then that, that's, I guess, just a trigger warning. So in light of the violence we've witnessed over the past few days, I think the title of this talk seems tragically more apt than ever. From Beirut to Paris, we continue to be forced witness to violent events, which for which the term tolerable, intolerable appears the most appropriate of descriptions. But what actually makes violence intolerable? And why is it that an intolerable act all too quickly leads to the tolerance for more pure forms of violence? With this in mind, the talk I'm going to give today actually develops on from a number of the um, pressing conceptual themes which myself and Henry actually dealt with in the Disposable Futures book. And in particular, our engagement with violence and its relationship to the spectacle. And what this means for understanding what I'm going to go into today, the connections between intolerable violence and sacrificial victims. The talk will speak directly to ideas, these ideas con uh, concerning the change in logics of violence in the 21st century. Notably, the shift from the dehumanization of victims, which became the hallmark of 20th century violence, to the humanization of violence today. And I'll explain what I mean by that. I want to start, however, with a simple and now seemingly self-evident proposition that in our mediatized age, we are all, at least all of us here at least, wit bearing witness and forced wit witness to violence in one way or another. Such witnessing is not, however, a neutral and objective process. It is highly policed through aesthetic regimes of mediated suffering. Such regimes prioritize our gaze, making us force witness to historical events that appear beyond our control, while supplementing the imagery with deeply politicizing narratives. This raises a whole number of important questions concerning representations of violence. What actually constitutes an intolerable image? How do we understand the logics of violence through the harvesting of our attentions? How can we interrogate violence diagnostically to reveal the hidden order of politics? And what does this mean for us, both in terms of developing an ethically astute critique of violence, which is adequate to our times, on to developing more peaceful relations amongst the world of people. In a widely celebrated book regarding the pain of others, Susan Sontag showed us the political function of representations of violence. As she noted from the Spanish Civil War onward, the problem of political violence has always been associated with the imminent problem of aesthetics and modes of representation. What is more, as she said, as she suggested, when dealing with aesthetics of violence, we're always dealing with the mediation of regimes of power, as photography in this particular case became integral to the cont contested terrain we know to be the truths of war. Robert Kappa's now infamous falling man soldier was important in this regard. Now, as Sontag noted, its publication in 1937 in Life magazine turns this violent moment into something which actually resembles a beautiful death, while affirming now all too familiar masculine tropes. The violence is both domesticated and amplified as its publication would appear alongside an advertisement for Vitalis, a men's hair cream product, as if to add a certain glamour to the portrait. Hiroshima and Nagasaki would invariably be a game changer in terms of aesthetics and set in motion the erasure of the human from representations of violence in particular. This is what Hannah Arendt understood to be the machinic triumph over the world of metaphysics as the technological ability to conquer terrestrial space would render us increasingly remote from ourselves and the world in which we inhabit. 
Hiroshima and Nagasaki also showed how the erasure from, of the human from the scene of the crime permits the most banal and horrifying displays of public celebration. Here we have on the left Miss Atomic Bomb and alongside a 1946 Life magazine image of US Navy Vice Admiral William Blandy and his wife cutting a celebratory cake in the image of a mushroom cloud. Giorgio Agamben in The Remnants of Auschwitz nuances the erasure of the human in his comments on the BBC film footage on the liberation of Bergen-Belsen. As he observes, whilst the footage is difficult to watch as we are forced witness to the mass of bodies piled upon one another, there is a moment in the film where the cameraman focuses in upon prisoners crouched upon the ground and wandering around as if they are ghosts. Agamben is drawing attention here to what the inmates called the Mussel Manor, or what Premo Levi called the drowned. Importantly, as Agamben notes, Whilst the cameramen spent some time filming the masses of corpses, the images of those who were effectively de dead while still alive proved too difficult to bear. It was an intolerable image. Hence, they are but given a moment's reflection. Or, as Agamben says, by drawing upon the work of Elias Canetti, while a heap of bodies might be an ancient spectacle, it's the intimate sight of the Mussel Manor which became an absolutely new phenomenon. It was unbearable to the human eyes. Now, turning to the mass violence of uh, September the 11th, 2001, it's quite remarkable, actually, how uniform the depictions of the horrifying event were in the print media. Reprinted to the point of monotony were images of exploding towers, leaving us in no doubt that a state of war was in effect. For all the horror, this was the image that was deemed most politically tolerable and, of course, politically expedient. How different might our response have been if Richard Drew's famous Im infamous sequence of the falling man had been selected instead? Unlike exploding towers that evidently function in a militaristic way, the falling man shifts the analysis from the material destruction to the personal, that is, to the human. This image, of course, became the intolerable face of 9-11 and um, resulted in a certain media censorship around it. As we're all too aware, what followed would be another war in Afghanistan and Iraq, most of it suitably timed for media bro broadcast. Something which Susan Sontag aptly termed shocking and awful. Now I want to turn to an article recently written by John Pilger, which connects this history to the contemporary moment. As Pilger notes, by most scholarly measure, Blair and Bush's invasion of Iraq and Afghanistan led to the deaths of some 700,000 people in a country which had no recorded history of jihadism. The parallels he notes with the bombing of Cambodia are painfully evident, as Americans on that occasion dropped the equivalent of five Hiroshima bombs on the country, on a peaceful country, during 1969 and 1973. The outcome was the emergence of an armed group of young men, all dressed in black, puritanical in their motives, uncompromising in their ambitions, now commonly known as the Khmer Rouge. As Pilger suggests, under such circumstances, one is never entirely sure what monsters will be created. Indeed, he argues the parallels with ISIS are all too apparent. An armed group of young men, all dressed in black, puritanical in their motives, uncompromising in their ambitions. The point I want to make here about ISIS is that the violent logics and dystopian outlook of this movement do not actually represent a radical departure. And you can note perhaps some, in terms of the dystopianism, the evident sy symbolic and aesthetic uh, symmetry here with m the movie Mad Max Fury Road. ISIS, in fact, merely accentuate the logic of a system whose dy dystopian imaginary pushes the spectacle of violence to the nth degree. And in doing so, they re reveal more fully the threshold between tolerable and intolerable forms of violence. Quite simply, the intolerable is the violence, the tolerable, sorry, is the violence we deem to be justifiable. The intolerable is the violence which is unjustifiable. Guy Debord's 1967 classic, The Society of the Spectacle, already pointed us to an emerging political landscape that would be increasingly defined by the violence of the media event. Indeed, as myself and Henry have argued in the Disposable Futures book, it's not just that the spectacle generates within societies a morbid fascination with tragic and catastrophic events. The spectacle has become the defining organizational principle for contemporary neoliberal societies, the spectacle of violence, I should say. 
It is the spectacle of violence which provides the condition of possibility for political rule. Indeed, as once familiar modern demarcations concerning inside and outside, friends and enemies, times of war, times of peace and so forth, have all but eviscerated, so the logics of terror and militarism have become normalized. We are suffocated intellectually, politically and emotionally by their ubiquitous presence. Forced to willfully engage in a Faustian pact that offers no possible escape route out of its nihilistic embrace. Just a few years after the board's publication, the author J.G. Ballard famously wrote an experimental novel titled The Atrocity Exhibition. The title alone, Atrocity Exhibition, is terrifyingly prescient for defining the contemporary moment. Every minute of every day, we inhabit digital spaces whose exhibits are truly atrocious. Ballard sensed this and actually provided some insightful commentary on the emerging political terrain, which would be increasingly defined by the spectacle of catastrophe and how this would radically alter our capacity for sustained ethical responses on account of its assault of the senses. As Ballard writes, and I'm going to read through this. The media landscape of the present day is a map in search of a territory. A huge volume of sensational and often toxic imagery inundates our minds, much of it fictional in content. How do we make sense of this ceaseless flow of advertising and publicity, news and entertainment, where presidential campaigns and moon voyages are presented in terms indistinguishable from the launch of a new candy bar or a deodorant? What happens at the level of our unconscious minds when within minutes on the same t TV screen, we could actually argue you now within imminent seconds, a prime minister is assassinated, an actress makes love, an injured child is carried from a car crash. Faced with these charged events, pre-packaged emotions already in place, we can only stitch together an emergency set of scenarios, just as our sleeping minds extemporaneize a narrative from the unrelated memories that veer through the cortical night. The screen has become a mobile map, which not only puts the world quite literally into our hands, it is also integral to understanding the logics of the spectacle of violence in the 21st century. On Wednesday, September the 2nd, 2015, the body of a young helpless refugee washed up on the shores of the Mediterranean. His name is Alian Kurdi a three-year-old child whose family was fleeing the conflict and violence tearing apart the place he once called home. The devastating image of this senseless and disturbing tragedy reverberated across so social media, particularly in the United Kingdom and Western Europe. The hashtag flotsam of humanity accompanied this very painful image. Whilst it is always difficult to measure the impact of such moments, it was not evident to many commentators that something was beginning to change in public attitudes and broader discourse concerning the refugee crisis in Europe. Alian thus became initially a potent symbol around which various humanitarian claims coalesced, concentrating in the process the unnecessary suffering endured by so many who suffered a similar fate and ended up dead in the waters. Alian seemed to speak in death to the sacrificial weight of recent history. His water-soaked body laid down and lifeless on the beach, resonated with what myself and Henry have called the intolerable, as a way to disrupt the aesthetic field of perceptions. Namely, it was a fundamental rupture or a breakthrough in how we come to know and see the world. A shattering, if, if you like, of what Jack Ronciere has termed a distribution of the sensible. It captured a truly intolerable moment. Its portrait was too difficult to bear, yet it was impossible to ignore. Allian's image certainly wasn't as vivid as other images of the crisis, which had been circulating around the internet for some time. But maybe that's the point. In an age of the spectacle, where lives are continuously rendered disposable, where the extreme parades is entertainment, while the graph graphic echoes the pornographic, force witnessing to tragic events often work by harvesting our attention, but for a moment's reflection. It's all about looking without actually seeing the wider political context. What then becomes more powerful and expressive in this overtly politicized and mediatized setting are image events that don't always follow some sensational scripting. Rather, the, the, the depictions unsettle but precisely because their intimate portrayals foster humane connections. This is not about abstract questions of death. It is to face the raw reality of its presence. Whilst Allian's image undoubtedly sparked more somber political reflections and mobilized a certain ethical awakening in terms of the crisis, 
There is, however, a fundamental question which still remains. Why did the image of this particular boy, amongst all others, have such a notable political and emotional effect? It certainly seemed to break new ground in terms of the media's approach to the crisis. As Hugh Pinay, the vice president of Getty Images, noted with some tragic honesty, the reason why we're talking about this photograph is not because the photograph has been taken. The reason we're talking about it is because it's been published by the mainstream media. It breaks a social taboo that's been in place for the press for over a decade. The picture of a dead child is one of the golden rules of what you never published. Pinney's comments invariably invoke memories here of Nick Utz's uh, Im image of Kim Pook, whose naked and burnt body became an iconic symbol of the Vietnam War, remaining one of the most enduring images of warfare in the 20th century, and certainly galvanized a great deal of su support in response to uh, the wars, particularly the wars in Vietnam. It's difficult, however, to explain the media events surrounding Allian's death by simply pointing to some shared empathy, as if the pictures which exposed us to the horrifying contingency of his tragedy perfectly resonated with the, picture, the sensibilities of picture editors and media alike. No image can be afforded such a universal status. Just a few days prior, for example, the artist Khaled Barakai published a series of equally tragic images of dead Syrian and Palestinian children whose boat on this occasion sank off the coast of uh, Libya in a mournful and devastated series titled Multicultural Graveyard. Such images also spread across the internet and social media, though on this occasion Facebook quickly shut them down as apparently it contravened its rules on publishing of graphic content. Did the image of Allian then just happen to take us over a tipping point? Did it actually expose us to the limits of censorship and the mediation of aesthetic regimes of suffering? Or was this actually something more relatable about his composition? Hence, it resonated with us, not because the image was exceptional or out of the ordinary, instead because it unsettled a world we all know too well, albeit a disrupted world we all know too well. How many tourist pictures are, after all, taken of children smiling, dancing, and rolling around on the beaches of the Mediterranean? Such images certainly force us to confront an alternative reality of disposable children, perishing on the same shores. As Peter Brokart, a director of Human Rights Watch, reflected, what struck me the most were his little sneakers, certainly lovingly put on by his parents that morning as they dressed him for his dangerous journey. Staring at the image, I couldn't help imagine that it was one of my own sons lying there drowned on the beach. Brokart then added with a tragic honesty, this is a child which looks a lot like a European child. The week before, dozens of African kids washed up on the beaches of Libya and were photographed and it didn't have the same impact. There is some ethnocentrism in the reaction to this image, certainly. Now, as many of you are aware, and as certainly as critical theorists have come to understand, aesthetics are crucial to any understanding of power relationships. How we narrate images, in fact, are crucial to the authentication and the disqualification of the meaning of lives. Images alone, however, offer no sure guarantee for immediate, immediate or indeed lasting impact on political change. Why certain images resonate draw upon a whole number of complex and competing political, social, emotional and indeed religious investments which defy neat explanation or blueprinting in terms of perfectible formulas. That is not to say, however, that images are incapable of being manipulated. On the contrary, the effective currency generated by aesthetics can often be used to, establish, to connect to well-established tropes in order to produce generalizable visceral reactions amongst us. Images are selected for public consumption to reinforce narratives and agendas such that they work in politically contrived ways. We can begin to engage this by connecting the image of Allian to other tragic images headlining and in widespread circulation at the time of his tragic death. A day before Barakai's images appeared, another refugee story dominated the media landscape in continental Europe. On this occasion, some 70 badly decomposed bodies were discovered in an airtight cooler lorry which was left abandoned on the roadside in eastern Austria. Again, a number of the victims were children. Whilst the images of suffering were less explicit in terms of being confronted with the bodies, its tragic potency was all too apparent as the truck's intended produce was pro processed meats for public consumption. The symbolic nature of this supplementing of disposable cargo seemingly eluded news and media outlets something students of biopolitics would have readily appreciated and rightly critiqued in terms of its evident neoliberal resonance. <laughs>
And that is, you can note a tragic um, dialectical transference taking place of a cameraman taking photograph of a cameraman who's taking a photograph of the disposable cargo inside. Such differing fortunes in terms of mobilizing a response raise fundamental questions regarding the political power of images and their capacity to bring about genuine political change, because on, in this case, there was no such calls. It's also worth pointing out that Allian's image also resonated powerfully in its singularity. The other 11 who died when the boat capsized and equally washed up on the beach don't feature in the photographs or in the frame. This raises searching questions regarding the shift towards more intimate forms of depicted suffering, which now seem to hallmark spectacles of violence in the contemporary moment. In a particularly insightful commentary, Nicholas Mursov refocuses our attention on the preferred mainstream media image depicting the young child cradled in the arms of a Turkish policeman. Why this composition impacted, as Mursov suggests, might again be explained in terms of our cultural resonances, and in particular in terms of Christian iconography. To quote, we can open our eyes to this photograph because it, the image reminds us something we know all too well. Such iconic images carry the power of the sacred. The posture of the policeman, Sergeant Mehmet Kiplak, who carries Allian's body and consciously echoes one of the key icons of Western art, known as Pieta, meaning pity. This frequently explored motif depicts the Virgin Mary holding the body of Christ. Now, for those of you who are unaware, this is Michelangelo's Pieta on the left. And I've actually referred to this previously in my critique of humanitarian aesthetics, notably Time Magazine's coverage of the Ethiopian famine during the 1980s, where this style of representation again became very common. Now, it's worth remembering that the Pieta style representation was deemed the most appropriate by media outlets and was the one that actually featured on the cover of the New York Times. For Ian Jack, this is explainable as it suits a finer idea of humanity, as the first image is much more intolerable as it represents the less comfortable proposition that death reduces even the liveliest child to a heap of flesh and bone. But this is the question which I think we all need to confront. Namely, what does it mean for critical thinkers and pedagogues to reproduce this image, to mediate upon it, to write about its presence in the company of our own children and loved ones, while remaining ethically sensitive to the senselessness, devastatingly intimate and terrifying contingency of its occurrence. That is to say, how do we all deal with the burdens of this image without becoming parasitic to the violence, latently dwelling upon its horror, normalizing its reception through repetition, which at best points to banalization and at worst reduces it to yet another spectacle of violence. As Kent Brintnell notes while commenting on the male body in pain, Representations of suffering bodies are a screen, a surface burnished with history's erasure. They can reflect the viewers and the victims' shared capacity for pain, trauma and suffering. Of course, representations of violated bodies do not always function this way. Cruelty, humour, voyeurism and indifference often intervene. Mirrors warp. The desire to explain is also the desire to explain away, to justify and somehow diminish the horror. I want to make clear here that I have no interest whatsoever in theorizing aesthetics for the sake of any discipline, and certainly not critical theory. Nor do I want to engage with aesthetics so we might glean something of the political outer modes of representation to authenticate some sovereign gaze. There are far too many sovereign academics in the world who claim some privileged vantage point. Like Jack Ronciere, it's my contention that politics is aesthetic, in so much as it's inextricably bound to the creation of images of thought images of the world. Politics is about the imagination, but not always according to some universal blueprint that paves the way to the castle of pure reason. On the contrary, as George Bataille observes, for aesthetics to be meaningful, it's necessary to give words the power to open eyes, to use words no longer to serve the ends of knowledge but of sight, as if they were no longer intelligible sighs but cries. It is, in other words, to connect the aesthetic with the poetic, the image with the discourse, such that the intolerable is always confronted and apprehended. Alongside images such as Allian, we also find emerging a number of complementary aesthetic themes concerning the nature of the crisis, which are no less problematic in terms of the way that aesthetics appear to us. 
Let's take the image of Antonius Della Gregoris, a Greek army sergeant who was captured saving a 24-year-old Eritrean woman, Wagazi Nabiat. This particular image from April 2015 again went viral and featured on the front pages of many news outlets again, including the New York Times. It was narrated as part of an heroic effort by Antonis, who in the process of rescuing some 20 refugees was subsequently awarded the Cross of Excellency. And yet the latent racial and gendered stakes to this image are all too apparent. It speaks in fact directly to militaristic valor, and as many commentaries subtly and explicitly mentioned, the notable beautification of both figures in the heroic scene. One newspaper commentary even went as far as to say it looked like a scene from a James Bond movie, as if that's any you know, endorsement. The following images, including the covers of The Economist, the Economist and a special report by Time magazine, also return us to themes of the sacred and the sacrificial. We're all, of course, aware how biblical stories of Exodus are bound up with tales of human flight from suffering and persecution and are often politicized by regimes and, and leaders to galvanize support for political causes. What concerns me here is less about their subtle or indeed apparent secularized adaptations, which no doubt are clear. My concern is the way in which such iconic images connect to sacred tropes in order to justify further violence. Indeed, it's my argument that the sacrificial victim is the surest way to inscribe the logics of violence to come. Taken together, what I'm trying to get you to maybe think about here is, or to, at least to, to uncover, is an intimate portrait of the encounter with contemporary forms of violence, which speaks directly to questions of sacrificial victims, notions of militaristic valor, onto the aesthetic mediation of suffering. It's worth reminding ourselves here of Francois Laurel's important contribution from his book, The General Theory of Victims. Here he explains the need for a more nuanced and ethically informed engagement with those who needlessly suffer from the catastrophic weight of historical forces. To quote, like any term that sees its media moment arrive, the victim passes through a stage of expansion, then of nausea, of ascendance, then of decline. Media corruption has made the victim a new ethical value for the exacerbation of ideological conflicts. Nowhere has this been more apparent than with the recycling of the image of Alien to further the calls for the mobilization of war in order to eventually bring about peace. The political hijacking of the Mediterranean crisis has been predictable and it's been deplorable. And we can say the same, of course, for the recent attacks in Paris as well. It's also worth pointing out that the very same day, for instance, the British Prime Minister David Cameron addressed the British Parliament to pledge his support for the refugees on account precisely of the image he encountered of Alien. He announced for the very first time in the same speech that the country had used drone technologies to assassinate people in Syria. Also, the so-called right-wing um, media's about turn on the refugee problem became much clearer. Here's a headline in the UK from Rupert Murdoch's The Sun tabloid, which quite clearly justifies violence in the name of the child, as it reads for Alien. Let's, of course, remember you that this is worth remembering that this took place prior to the Paris attacks, which makes such violence now seem very inevitable. To use the child's image in this way is arguably fascistic in the way Wilhelm Reich understood the term. It's all about manipulating the desire for justice, such as an intolerable image of a dead child is appropriated, repackaged, and strategically redeployed to sanction further violence and destruction. So once again, like Afghanistan, Iraq, and Libya, to name a few, the drumbeats to war are orchestrated by showing apparent sympathy with an all-too-human crisis. Not, however, to provoke serious political and philosophical discussion on the violence and disposability of populations. On the contrary, it's to end up punishing those in whose name we claim to be speaking for in the first place. Such is the cyclical nature of violence in our times. Now, we previously introduced the concept of the intolerable, particularly in the final chapter of the Disposable Futures book, to highlight and interrogate the mediation of suffering by contemporary neoliberal regimes of power. In doing so, attention was drawn to the ways in which groups such as ISIS mimic the nihilistic logic of the times by utilizing the intolerable for devastating political effect. ISIS, in fact, have mastered the use of symbolic violence in their own scenes of sacrifice. Indeed, if the violence of the 20th century pointed to clear and normalized forms of dehumanization to bring about the slaughter of millions, 
What makes it different with ISIS is precisely the foregrounding of the human as a sacrificial category. The sacrificial victim is inscribed with clear symbolic value, whether they are the progressive liberal, the aid worker, the journalist, or the homosexual. In doing so, they have already forced us to confront more purposefully the relationship between intolerability, the performance of killing, and the ethical question of sacrifice. We should also be mindful here of the sophisticated ways that ISIS have targeted those communities who would normally be supportive of refugees in Europe. What ISIS would like nothing, like, um, nothing more, it seems, is to provoke a global war, bring about a truly sacred clash, while ensuring locally the containment of populations to either convert them or, more terrifyingly still, to orchestrate the genocide. Again, not too dissimilar to the history of the Khmer Rouge. They seem, in fact, to be engaged in a truly tragic wager, namely that the chance of one suicidal terrorist getting through and sacrificing themselves for the cause is enough for Europe to now turn its back on the saving of however many innocent lives, as this takes us beyond our levels of tolerability. So how might we gain a better insight into this theoretically? Building on from the work of Walter Benjamin, amongst others, we owe it to Giorgio Agamben for pushing forward our thinking on the idea of sacrifice as a fundamental political category in the context of the willful, calculated and systemic killing of human lives. As Agamben argues, for dehumanization to take place, then the death occurs without a sacrifice. There is no sacrifice to be attributed. Whilst this, this has been important in terms of thinking about dehumanized, dehumanized forms of violence, and has certainly been um, um, galvanized much of the attention on Agamben's important work, I think too much focus has been given to the deaths without sacrifice. And what we need to turn to instead is look upon the symbolic violence of the sacrificial and what this means for the continuation of violence in the world today. In other words, we need to ask what symbolic violence is, is being inscribed upon the body of victims such that fur further violence can be sanctioned. Alien embodied the sacrificial victim. The image of his body concentrated our attentions on the bloody reality of the situation, as his tragic death brought about the calls for more ethically sensitive and hu humane responses to the crisis. But it's also brought, brought about the calls for more violence. However, what would have happened to the body of Alien had this image, like so many others, eluded public attention? What if the body of the image hadn't captured the attentions of picture editors at that particular moment in time? What if his body, like so many others, had simply vanished at sea without a trace. What if a lion had been shot on the very same day? Hence the death of that innocent child simply registered as yet another statistic in the ongoing production of nameless and faceless victims. Here then we encounter a fundamental difference between the wider tragedy of human disposability, whose lives continue to be written and yet whose biographies remain forgotten, against those who we come to attribute a metaphysical um, meaning to the suffering in order to justify further forms of violence. Indeed, as we now, this seems very apparent, once the sacrificial makes its entry into political discourse, complicity is easily written out of the script as the need for new thinking is displaced by the intellectual violence of realist orthodoxy that continues to reveal theological traces. Sacrificial victims all too easily become the generative principle to further violence. Or as President Hollande has remarked, what's now needed is the purest form of justice, a pitiless war, as if the previous age of violence was somehow marked by compassion. With this in mind, there is a need to develop our understanding of contemporary violence by reorienting our position on the meaning of disposable lives. This requires us to provide further conceptual insight into the interplays between intolerable violence and sacrificial victims, and the political appropriation of sacrificial victims. All violence has a history. That much should be clear to us. This requires us to be much more attentive to alternative histories of violence, along with the need to rethink human geographies of violence in the 21st century. Now, in my previous work, I've attended to the ways in which the deserts are now reappearing as integral to global imaginaries of threat. The planetary waters, in so many ways, are also increasingly part of this new catastrophic topography of endangerment, something citizens of New Orleans and indeed the poor areas of Manhattan know all too well. <laughs> 
I'm not, of course, arguing you that we have now suddenly discovered that the deserts or waters have uh, political meaning or significance. On, my con on the contrary, my interest is to look at the way in which they've always been ascribed with political and philosophical meaning, especially when compared to so-called progressive urban settings. And how this provides a new novel window into the survivability of politics in the 21st century. Histo historians might, of course, encourage us here to focus more broadly on the political legacies of imperial projects more generally. Not least, perhaps, the Roman Empire, for whom the waters had a very special meaning, particularly the Mediterranean. Mare Nostrum, literally, the body of water. Now, one of the chapters which I'm actually working on in a forthcoming book looks at the way in which we need to understand how space itself has always been violently embodied. And again, connecting to the legacies of the Khmer Rouge, one poignant example of what I am terming the flesh of the earth appears in this famous scene from Roland Joffe's cinematic score, The Killing Fields. The earth year is quite literally constituted by the flesh of disposable populations. Yet with remarkable similarity to this scene, we can also point to the violent embodiment of the waters historically as well as contemporaneously. None more so than the writings of Dante, ascribed during Gustave Dore's famous illustration. The embodiment of the waters has in fact, as Carl Schmitt theorized, been fundamental to the establishment of the key ordering principles of worldly affairs. Now, without digressing too much, I do think it's worth just pointing out here for students of political theory as well. I'm sure many of you are aware of this image, which is arguably the most famous image to accompany any political text. And I'm referring, of course, to the frontispiece for Thomas Hobbes's The Leviathan. This book is significant for a whole number of reasons, not least in the contemporary political moment, um, and in terms of the ways in which um, claims to security seem to trump all forms of liberty. As Thomas Hobbes argues in the, in the Leviathan, a book which you could argue enshrines the security imperative, there is no politics without security, and there is no security without the state. And of course, it's from this frontispiece of Hobbes' Leviathan that the very term, the body politic, actually originates. So the pol political itself is always embodied. Um, but I th the point I want to make here also, as you can see in the far um, right composition, the Leviathan is actually emerging from the waters. And if any of you know the history of the term, the Leviathan, the Leviathan re used to refer to the beast of the ocean, which suddenly became embodied on the land. So what I'm trying to get you to think about maybe is that just as we might write the violent history of the earth, as familiar biological terms such as dissection have been applied with equal force to populated spaces, so the planetary waters tell their own histories of violence and oppression. However, where does the scars of suffering often leave permanent marks and traces upon geographical landscapes, the body of water retains its capacity for disappearance, lost at sea often to vanish without a trace. Contemporary stories regarding the unnecessary suffering of bodies at the mercy of the oceans should resurrect, in fact, the wretched ghosts of the transatlantic slave trade, wherein the commodification of life resulted in the genocide of millions. The planetary waters are, in fact, the veritable graveyard of human disposability, as shown here in Turner's famous painting, The Slave Ship, where the waters, again, are inviolably embodied. In doing so, the waters also point to a spatial genealogy of violence that demands our attention. Though for its victims, forms of remembrance are much more difficult to locate. What does, however, mark a departure in the contemporary moment is the realization that oceans and deserts are now the final frontiers in a world which is assumed to be full. People are quite literally being pushed to the ends of the earth. What's therefore demanded is a logical inversion of spatial politics, not in ways that continue to prioritize geographical demarcations over its human content but to be attendant instead to those forces which are now overwhelming the logics of containment. Or as Mel Herman Melvin would write, it's not done on any map, true places never are. In terms of looking to the alternative to the violences of the ocean, wherein the waters themselves now appear as a weapon of war imbued with their own lethal principles, it might be tempting to follow the legacy of Schmidt back to Agamben, once again to return to the understanding of the camp as the defining paradigm of the modern. The Syrian refugee is certainly exposed to the violence of the camp, which in terms of scale alone seems to deny any meaningful political and ethical responses. Of the 1.8 million registered refugees to be officially documented since the start of the conflict in March 2011, the Zatari refugee camp situated in the middle of the Jordanian desert, for example, homes some 80,000 refugees, all living in makeshift tents within a five mile radius.
This makes it actually the fourth largest city in the country. Now, as Mark Duffield has argued, populations have been routinely contained in such camps in order to better manage the life chance divide separating the global north and the global south. Such divides, he argues, are never geographically fixed. They are determined by the individual biographies of those requesting passage. In this regard, borders are not about fences, borders are not about walls, borders are not about surveillance cameras. Borders begin with the body. Borders, in fact, are always um, biopolitically authored. Whilst there is a broader genealogy to consider here, it is important to situate the contemporary on mass displacements, particularly in Syria, in a global neoliberalized context. Not least the neoliberal wars of the past 15 years, and I think it's right to call them neoliberal wars. Nobody has understood the plight of the refugees better than Zygmunt Bauman. As he has explained, what defines the recent condition of the refugee is what he calls a frozen transience, where the preferred method of encampment means they are literally catapulted into a nowhere. Maybe we might extend this in the context of what seems to be foreboding for the Syrian refugee as a nihilistic nowhere. They are literally being thrown into the deserts or into the oceans. Such enclosures, however, should not be interrogated, as Bauman reminds us, by simply relying upon security or legal rights-based discourses. They demand ethical critique, which, appreciative of the history of the violence of the camp, looks directly into the ethical distancing they create amongst people, as its inhabitants are reduced to a problem population stripped of political agency. What the refugees, however, evidence today is the crisis of containment. Whether that refers to the desire to flee war-torn situations instead of waiting for some international response, or to actively resist the policies of encampment. That many prefer to make the treacherous journey across the Mediterranean instead of seeking refuge in the camps of neighboring Arab states speaks volumes in this regard. Indeed, whilst many po policymakers write of this in terms of economic opportunism, as images from mainland Europe have shown, the refugee is fully aware of the political function of the camp and how its humanitarian ascriptions are merely illusionary. Here's an image of um, Hungarian refugee, uh, refugees sorry, in Hungary um, being forced onto a um, train, each of them carrying signs which space clearly states no camp. The refugee is fully aware of the political function of the camp. Containment is therefore in crisis as the camps are being overwhelmed, physically, ethically, and politically. This should come as no surprise. In today's radically interconnected world, defined and shaped by global imaginaries of threat, the camp has been subsumed within broader logics of neoliberal power, adding further depth to what Peter Sloterdijk calls the world interior. So one of the questions, of course, we face is that how can we continue to make an ethical intervention here, especially in light of the recent violence? We can begin, perhaps, by recognizing that taking flight across the treacherous waters is an example of what we might term a non-decision decision. What does it mean when the most attractive option is to give oneself over to a much less certain alternative, when the certainty is death? As the poet Wasan Shire wrote in the poem titled Home, no one puts their children in a boat unless the water is safer than the land. Ethically speaking, then, it's important to hold on to the notion that regardless of how desperate the situation, the flight across, across the oceans is an affirmation of people's humanity. It's impossible to imagine what it must be like to have to watch your family board a small dinghy. What we can do is approach the issue with ethical sensitivity, foregrounding the agency of those who face such a predicament. It, rec it requires of us to recognize the humanity of victims and their desire for freedom and dignity. This takes us some way into understanding Laurel's point that the victim is more than a problem to be solved and that they might actually be seen as a site for rethinking resistance in the 21st century. So how are we to make sense of the political stakes to all of this? And this is a question which I've been troubled with over the last few days. And as Henry Giroux has pointed out in a recent correspondence to myself, very few voices are taking the barbaric acts in Paris as part of what might be called the war on youth. The terrorists in this case targeted places where young people gather, it's okay. sending a message that suggests that young people have no future. In this script, war becomes the only option for young people to take. The forms of violence we witness today are not only an attack on the present, they have a futurity. They connect directly to the age of catastrophe and its multiple forms of endangerment. The normalization of terror onto the production of catastrophic futures. It is not a war that can be simply understood in terms of its duration, 
The war is all about pro projection. It's all about attempting to colonize the future imaginary. And I should have actually put it. And as a reading of um, Gottfried Heilwein's remarkable piece, I Walk Alone, might suggest, it asks that we are blinded to the violence of historical forces already walking amongst the ruins of the future. To conclude, I would like to ask how we might um, collectively think against violence, given this terrain of imagination warfare. What I've tried to argue here is that what actually constitutes violence is a question which not only gets us into the heart of critical thought, but needs to be at the forefront of critical pedagogy and public pedagogy. Violence, in fact, has never been a value-neutral value or, or objective process and should never be theorised in the abstract. Violence is not an object to be studied. It's a lived process which, through its very enactment, authenticates and disqualifies the meaning of lives. One of the most urgent questions to be faced today, as Walter Benjamin wrote some, quite some time ago, is how do we develop a critique of violence which is adequate to our times, which does ethical justice to the subject? This, I would argue, moving away from asking, what is violence? Such a question simply ends up confirming pre-existive normative and political ideas regarding the world. An alternative critique of violence attempts to understand the ways in which violence functions politically, especially in terms of the daily spectacle to which we are all continuously forced witness. Such a critique attends to the politics of violence by asking what subjectivities are actually produced through its performances, which in turn asks how violence comes to shape political and philosophical understanding. Violence in this regard has become the dominant condition of possibility for the furtherance of political rule. To, to offer some final form of conclusion to maybe get some, um, a hold on this, I'd like to end with um, Auguste Rodin's sculpture, The Thinker, which is arguably still one of the most famous human embodiments of political and philosophical inquiry. The symbolic form given to Rodin's isolated and contemplative sculpture alone should raise a whole number of critical concerns for us, not least the way in which its ethnic, masculine and athletic form speaks to evident racial, gendered and biopolitical grammars. However, what also concerns the viewer is an attempt to engage in some form of conversation with this work. In its presence, we're invariably asked to contemplate what is the thinker actually contemplating? Now, from this picture, and this is the, very, the most common picture of Rodin's thinker, we could, of course, suggest that the thinker could be thinking about anything in particular. We just hope it's something serious. However, such ambiguity was not as Rodin originally intended. Here we have a picture from the original 1880 sculpture, where the thinker is now situated kneeling before the gates of hell. We might read this as significant for a whole number of reasons. It is the scene of violence which gives specific content to Rodin's thinker. Thought begins for the thinker in the presence of the raw realities of violence and suffering. The thinker is being forced to suffer into truth. The thinker's physical posture, in fact, is determined by the multiplicity of violent performances taking um, shape behind, whose brutalities are often hidden from sight from us in the more familiar depictions. Two, there is an interesting ambiguity here, however, in terms of the thinker's relationship to violence. Does the thinker actually turn away from the intolerable scene behind to contemplate the violence? This, I would argue, is a tendency, unfortunately, all too common when thinking about violence today, to turn away and abstractly think about the violence without confronting its intolerable conditions. Three, according to one purposeful reading, the figure in this commission is actually Dante, the poet, who is contemplating the circles of hell as narrated in the Divine Comedy. This is significant, for rather than looking away, might it be that the fi figure is now actually staring directly into the abyss before, raising the question of what does it mean to be forced witness to violence. But as we know with Dante, the witnessing of violence for him could be calmly reasoned, rationalized and calculated and subjected to the most compromising of thought processes. What is more, as Edward Said noted, it's with Dante that Orientalism truly begins to assume a monumental intellectual force. Seeing others as a problem to be solved begins out asserting claims to violence, born of a particular narrative to the witnessing of its events, something which Franz Fanon understood all too well. And finally, not in any way incidental, 
In the original commission, the thinker is actually called the poet. This, I want to argue, is deeply significant for actually rethinking the future of the political. The thinker was initially conceived as a being with both a tortured body and almost a damned soul, and yet a free-thinking human, determined to transcend its suffering through imagination. We continue to be taught that politics is a social science, and its true um, command is located in the power of an analytics. Such has been the hallmark of centuries of reasoned, rationalized, and calculated violence in the name of human progress. Violence, we might argue, which has made the intolerable appear altogether arbitrary and normal. Counter this demands a rethinking of the political itself, connecting to new vocabularies, to conceive of politics perhaps as a more poetic art form, with much more compassion, which is tasked with imagining better futures and styles for living amongst the world of people. A counter which takes pedagogy and education seriously, harnessing the power of the imagination and equipping our children and youths with the confidence that the world can be transformed for the better. Thank you for your time.